Well, good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and kick things off here. Uh, my name is Mark Tedeschi. I'm the Director of Sales, and I'm here in the Texas office. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to be handing things off to Arlene Coletti, who's in our uh, corporate headquarters up in New Jersey. And I believe there is probably a uh, skyline picture on your screen right now. That's outside our window of our corporate office. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us here today, and then we'll do our best to make the most of your time. Um, before we get started, I want you to note that you have a control panel on your screen, and it looks something like what is in uh, this slide here. And um, you also have a questions pane. You can send questions to our webinar staff through this pane uh, by typing in your question and just clicking send. At the end of the presentation, we'll also do a Q&A session. Uh, you can raise your hand and speak directly to the webinar staff. We'll unmute you, and you can ask your question. Um, I know a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, Universal. Uh, for those of you who are not, our company was founded in 1990, and uh, we've been specializing in systems for the masonry industry for quite some time. And uh, we have implemented systems for companies such as uh, state materials, only on the block and brick, uh, Hankel Block and Mason, Stone Center of Virginia, uh, Taylor Concrete, Nicolia Industries, and, and many, many more throughout uh, many U.S. states and actually internationally now as well. Um, um, if you, again, if you have any questions throughout the uh, um, presentation, please feel free to use the questions pane. And um, I'm going to hand it over to our product specialist, Arlene Coletti. Go ahead and uh, take it away, Arlene. Thank you. So today our topic is how do leading Mason suppliers outperform their competition? It's a relevant topic because this industry can be quite competitive. When you're not the only game in town, when your customers have a choice as to where they're going to purchase their products, you really need to focus on the aspects of your business that tip the scales in your favor. And while price of your product is always important, and we are going to show you ways to protect and ensure your profitability, there are many other factors that contribute to your business success to your company being the supplier of choice for your customers. We're going to touch on points today that have already helped many other Mason Supply companies, as Mark stated. And as we uh, show you things, we're going to bring up one small change to your business that could literally save you tens of thousands of dollars or more per year. For those of you who may have seen our product in the past, we're going to include the new features that we've added over the last uh, months, really, and year um, for some of our other masonry clients. Because this is a very brief session and this is a comprehensive solution, we're going to be moving quite quickly. It's a high-level view. But whether you're a retailer, a distributor, or a producer, or even all three, we have some ideas that will hopefully make you, you know, eat every one of you think about these things. We only have about five minutes for each area, so well, let's get started. First, we're going to discuss three challenges for the mason industry. The first challenge, well, imagine this. It's been raining for a week. That's the first challenge, right, the weather. Today is the first beautiful sunny day at 6.30 a.m., and you have a line of contractors out the door. What do you think the challenge is? That's right. It's taking care of your customers quickly and getting them out the door. And this is a big challenge because it can make or break your reputation, right? Because if it takes you forever to process the transaction, what do you think is going to happen the next time your customer is in a rush for a product? So what practical things have other highly successful Mason companies done to manage this? Rather than tell you, we're going to show you. Let's put ourselves at the front counter um, of your Mason supply business. The first customer walks in, and he has an account with us. So let's take a look at how this might actually happen. Hey, Mike, how's everything? OK, Arlene, how about with you? Very good. What can I do for you today? Uh, I need two cubes of the 8816s. OK. Did you want that blade you're holding as well? Oh, uh, yes. What else can I get for you? Uh, also, I needed some easy sand compound. OK. Hmm. OK, I have the 20, 45, and 90. Uh, I'll take the 45. How many? Uh, just one for now. 
Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Uh, can you put that on my account? Mm. Um, you know, Mike, you're a little bit over your credit limit. Um, do you want me to refer this upstairs to accounting for approval? Uh -huh, no, that's okay. I'll just give you a credit card. Okay, that'll be great. I'm just going to swipe your card. Okay, just sign for me, Mike. Okay, here's your invoice. And I think you're good to go. Thanks, Arlene. Thank you. I could have given him a receipt, a small size receipt, not so small, it's a four by four size receipt that also incorporates the signature. And some masonry uh, companies use this as a yard ticket with no prices, more for a loading document, but you have your options. Now, did you catch the five elements, at least five, that were in that transaction to speed things up? Well, we are going to review them. <clears throat> and we'll do it really quickly. The first was alternate purchase and selling units. We sold the 8x8x16 eight by eight by as a cube, even though it was also available in each. Some products are sold by many different uh, selling units or fractions of a selling unit. For example, you might sell things normally by the pallet, but you also sell by a section at times, which maybe is a fifth of a pallet. So you need to have that flexibility. The second thing you saw was barcode scanning, very obvious. It speeds up the counter and ensures that your counter personnel sell the right item at the right price. So obviously this is not going to lend itself to selling a pallet of brick, but I'm sure in most of your um, facilities you have showrooms with blades and trowels and all, all, all sorts of tools and things. So you can both generate and read barcode labels. We also had sub-searching capabilities when we looked for the Easy Sand compound. That's important that you're able to find items quickly when they're not barcoded or when you don't know the item number. The fourth element was electronic signature capture. Note that the system is storing the signature. So think of how many times you call customers trying to collect money that they owe you, and they want proof of pickup or who signed for the product. Sometimes it's a genuine request. And other times, it's a stall tactic, perhaps. So in any case, you want to be able to quickly and easily email or fax a copy with a signature in seconds. And that's what you can do, whether it's the day later, a day later, or a year later. You can give the customer an invoice with prices or not prices. I didn't show that to you, but I just wanted to point that out. The fourth hour, the fifth element, was integrated credit card. Now, how can that enhance accuracy and efficiency? Well. Integrated credit card means you can simply click the screen and swipe the card. And it processes in sex seconds with either an approval or if it's a decline, you can take another method of payment. The benefits? Well, your staff is not swiping the credit card on a standalone unit and punching in an amount, which leaves a huge margin for error. Your credit card transactions, like all others, post all the way through the accounting modules from one point of entry. And now you can even accept debit cards with pin pads through the software. This has a huge impact in the reduction of your credit card fees. And the new legislation, which went through this year or a couple of months ago, actually makes this even more of a benefit to you. So if you're not taking debit cards, you should consider doing so. OK, there was actually another element of this transaction that should have hit home with every company on this call. Um, before we tell you what it is, we're going to ask you a quick question in the form of a poll. And uh, you should see that on your screen. And we basically just want to know what you do at your counter. Now, I, we should point out we can't see who is clicking what. We can only see anonymous results. So if you would click there, we'll, we would be able to uh, answer this question. Are you using software specifically for the mason supply industry, QuickBooks or Peachtree, or pen and paper? OK, so some of you are using software specifically for the industry, and others of you are using QuickBooks or Peachtree. None of you are manual. Well, that's good. <laughs> but um, it's one area of the business 
that we're going to talk about that you need real caution. And that is taking unnecessary credit risks and not staying on top of collections. So if you have customers with accounts, which I'm sure all of you do, well, let me just close the poll so that you can see the screen again. <clears throat> okay, and I'm assuming that you can see the screen now. If not, someone will come and flag me down. Um, if you have customers with accounts who want to find ways to reduce your risks and accelerate the collection process, using one solid integrated system is a proven way to be more efficient and cut unnecessary costs. When you enter a charge customer, as I'm going to do here, the system should do the work for you and do all of the appropriate checks. If your accounting department puts a customer on credit hold, that should come up on the screen. You shouldn't have to talk to anyone about it. But what if they're not over their credit, uh, on credit hold, but they're over their credit limit? Well, in that case, let me do a quick... Um, <clears throat> quick transaction, and of course I pick a customer, a wrong customer. Hold on one second. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Just thinking. <laughs> The customer's credit information should kick in automatically. So this customer is over his credit limit, and it presents to you some information in summary as to what's going on so that you can see why he's over his credit limit. Is it open orders that are throwing him over the limit? Is it the fact that he's late in paying you? You can tell all of that from this screen. But let's take this one step further. I can actually click from the point of sale screen and get more information. For example, I'm looking at the customer's account, and I can, for example, if he asks for a statement, maybe he says, listen, just email me or print me a, a, a statement. You can click Print Statement. I'm going to print it to the screen, but I could easily email this right now. Now he looks at it for a second. Let's say I give it to him, and he says, what's on this invoice? You can click. You can look at what product was on that invoice, or you can reprint it, again, with a signature. So I've done all of this from the point of sale screen, and I can keep things moving. Now, if you're using multiple pieces of software, or if you're using a standalone accounting package where you're not feeding your point of sale system with the credit information, you could be exposing yourself to unnecessary risk. So it is a proven fact that using a fully integrated system, not multiple pieces of software, definitely reduces your credit risks and accelerates the collection process. Okay, our next customer just walked in. Now, this is a brand new customer. We've never seen them. There's two types of walk-ins. There's a walk-in where they're anonymous and you don't need to really take their name and information. Um, and then there's the other kind. They're unfamiliar to you, but you do want to keep information on this transaction. I'm not going to open any type of an account for him but maybe he's going to return product in the future. And so I don't want to have him just anonymously under the walk-in or the cash customer. At any time during the tra uh, transaction, I can scan his or her driver's license ID. Now, here's an example of why you might do that. What if your customer says this to you? Hey, Arlene, can I pay you by check? OK, so he wants to pay me by check. He even knew my name because I have a name tag on, but I don't know him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start scanning product. Actually, let me do that one more time because I was hitting a couple things. Let's do that one more time. Putting a, a license in. I'm scanning product. My license expired, so it did tell me that. That's one good thing to know, because they might have found this on the street, and so now they're giving you some an expired license. But it pulled the information and the image. So you have that on file. Even though this is not a customer in your customer database, it will be permanently attached to this transaction. So if this person tries to return product, you'll be able to look at the ticket 
and know if it's the same person, know if they bought this product, and so forth. Because you'll be able to look it up by this information that was extracted from the magnetic stripe on the back. OK, so you can use that driver's license principle to add new customers at the counter. So if you have people at the counter who maybe typing isn't their uh, most favorite thing in the world, or they're not that fast, Putting in a driver's license when you're adding a new customer will pull this information to the appropriate fields and, again, keep the image. OK, so now here's another scenario that happens all too often. It slows down the counter. So I'm selling this product here, and the customer says, I would like this paper, but I, I really don't know how many I need, but I have to cover a 200 square foot area. OK, so the customer showed me the block or the paver. I put the item in. And as soon as I type in that product, a field right underneath here, this little field, appeared. What I'm going to do is I'm going to key something in there. And I want you to keep your eye on the quantity field, because I'm going to put in the amount of square footage that he said he wanted to cover. And it calculated 900 pavers that I need for this. Well, how did it do that? When you're setting up your inventory, and we're going to go to the setup of that product, there's a field called square footage. And that is the conversion factor. Um, so 200 square feet times 4.5 is going to give me the 900. Also, while we're here, I'm going to show you, you can store images of your item, which can be helpful. You can also store other things. For example, if you have PDFs on your server, of your material safety sheet, or as we said, photos. Or maybe you want to go right out to a manufacturer's website. I have two screens here. That's why I keep dragging this over. I've just clicked within my software, and it's taking me to the manufacturer's website. So we're waiting for that to come up here. And I have a lot going on on my, on my computer right now. So it's taken me to that manufacturer's website. And then I can get right out and go back into my software. OK, so these are things that can you know, speed things up. But now let's get back to that transaction. Because there was something else that's happening. You see here, it's telling you for this quantity the uh, number of bands and pallets that this equates to. So this can be helpful, but let's see where this really comes into play. We promised you one feature that was going to literally save you thousands of dollars. It's done that for other clients. So let's print the receipt and an invoice and show you this transaction. We're just going to take cash for this one. We'll skip the signature. You've seen that. And we're going to print a receipt first. And underneath that product, it's telling you how many pallets, how many each. Now, that's the terminology I'm using on this pro item. You could use whatever you use, band, section, bundle, pallet, skid, whatever is appropriate. Notice that that also prints on the invoice. And it prints on any picking or delivery documents without prices, which is ideal for loading documents. So what's the practical? application of this. Well, we've had clients who've said to us, you know, we do a lot of transactions per day. During busy season, it gets crazy around here. And we watch our staff walking around with calculators. They're loading and doing calculations. It's nuts. So one of the owners said, you know, one day, and he actually said this to, I was there when he said this, one day I was watching out the window as my staff would load. And I know they're loading eight or nine extra pavers on each load just to cover themselves so the customer doesn't come back in case their calculation is wrong. And as they're loading, I'm watching and I'm thinking, 80 cents, 80 cents, 80 cents, as each brick went on the truck. The day we delivered this function, he said, thank you very much. Now that this prints, the system just paid for itself. Now that, that might seem like an exaggeration. So let's do the calculations together. This particular client, let me get my calculator over here. This particular client uh, did about 500 transactions per day during busy season. But even if you only have a fraction of that, let's say 50, how would that work out for you? Well, let's take 80 cents times 8 extra pavers times 50 orders a day times 5 days a week. Did I hit 5? Wait a minute. 
times five days a week times 52 weeks a year. That equates to over $83,000 a year in savings that that one feature of the software can represent for you. And that's if you're only doing 50 orders a day. Now we realize this is not for everybody. If you don't break bundle sections, bands, and other things, then you know there is another benefit to you. And that is when someone orders a particular quantity, you'll immediately see on the screen before you get to the totaling piece of this. Remember, we saw on the screen over here what the bundle section spans each is. So if you see that this is breaking down to less than a full bundle or a section, you can either go up to the next level, add another section or another band, or break the band and upcharge them for that. There are upcharge capabilities in this system. So from this one transaction, we've seen three more time-saving elements. Driver's license scanning, which you just saw, the square footage conversion, and the big one, accurate loading quantities. Now here's another scenario where you can absolutely make your customers experience so much better than your competitors. The next customer walks in, it's a repeat customer, the same customer we were using before. So let's put him in. And he says this to you. I need more of the same paver that I bought back in January for the South Seneca job. So what happens in your store when that happens? If you have to start looking around through files or reports or even go to another area of your software, that's a time-consuming investigation that you can avoid. By just clicking inquiry sales order history, uh, customer sales history, sorry, I'm having the um, history of every product that this customer bought for me. And I can change by clicking on the headings the order of things. Right now it's showing me from most recent backwards. Now depending on how you put things in your system, for example, if the job number is in the PO, then that you can see it here. Otherwise, as I scroll over, there's the ship to name, the job name. There's so many fields that you can search by. Once I find the South Seneca job back in January and I look, I can I say, okay, it's this um, paper, then I can highlight it and copy it. And I'm good to go there. So pulling up sales history quickly is something that can, happens throughout um, a good, any good system. Another issue that seems to be complicated in calc is calculating true product costs and then setting sell prices. When you think about being the preferred vendor over your competition, it usually comes down to two things, right? It's customer service, which we've just discussed, getting the customer out the door as quickly as possible when he's in a rush, and pricing. And while you want to price competitively, you really need to be sure that you're making enough profit as well. It's not just about attracting the customer. So before you establish sell prices, you really need to know the true cost of your products. Unlike other types of businesses, knowing the cost of Mason products is not so straightforward because you need to factor in freight, duty, sometimes other charges as well. We're talking about landed costs. Different companies do this in different ways. We're going to show you three methods that companies are using. <clears throat> and it's right here. Landed cost can be calculated manually by knowing for an item what the freight and the duty and so forth is. And some companies actually do know that. And so what they want to do is they want to be able to key it in. So this is the screen I showed you before. But when you click this button for on the item maintenance, this little window appears. So I can actually key in my freight, duty, and miscellaneous, click Update, and it will add those costs into the landed cost field along with either the average or the standard that I might be using. But that's only one method. Not everyone does that. Others want to calculate landed cost each time they do a receiving based on item weight. Well, how does that work? We'll quickly show you that when you do a receiving, I don't remember the PO number. There we go. OK, so let's say we received this complete. Of course, we could receive partial. In this case, it's showing me that on these products, I already have the item weights in the system, which is great. If I didn't, I could enter them from this screen and have that write it back 
to the inventory maintenance because maybe, for example, sometimes we convert companies and they didn't always have pro software that kept the weights in the system. So now that they do, they're adding them as they go along. Okay, so now the weights are in there, but what about the freight? So let's say we're going to add $2,500 worth of freight and there was $300 of duty, 200 of something else, and even some tax for some of our uh, foreign clients, that's important. So you have this money now here that is going to be allocated by the system. And this is just here to show you that it's been allocated, both the freight dollars and the miscellaneous dollars, based on the weight percentage of each line item. It's, it's um, um, allocated all of that money and even goes right down to the unit level so that you can get and arrive at a landed cost per purchasing unit. Okay, that's the other method. Now there's one more, and that is by dollars. So it's the same principle, but instead of looking at the weights of the items, it looks at the line item dollars of the purchase order and figures out each percentage of the line item versus the total dollars received on that purchase order and allocates the freight with that percentage, regardless of the method that you use. The fact that you know your landed cost is very important, right? Because A, it's a great reference for you, and B, you can base your pricing on a more accurate cost. If a paver costs you 80 cents, but it costs you 95 to get it to your uh, location, then you really should be basing your pricing on your freighted cost. And if you can build formulas on that, as I'll show you here, let's just take an example. Let's take an example of an Eagle, sorry. of an Eagle Bay product. I have a landed cost in here. Well, actually, what I have is I have a pricing type formula. So let me show you something. When you create formulas, if you were to use formulas, you can say, OK, my formula for Eagle Bay is landed cost times 1.85 for the A price. The B price would be 1.35, and so forth. You could mark up. You could divide. There's so many things that you can do, but having the landed cost information is the first step. So, OK, you know your cost. The next challenge is pricing. Why is that a challenge? Well, we're going to ask you one other question here just to kind of keep things moving. So let me see if I could find my little poll. Maybe not. We might not be asking you a question after all. OK. Well, what we'll do is we will simply ask you, and you can <laughs> nod if this is you. Let's take a particular brick or paver. Do you sell that item at the same price to everyone who walks through the door? I would venture to say that everyone you, of you is nodding your head no, because you sell different prices to homeowners versus contractors, different prices based on selling unit, based on nego negotiated pricing level, based on contracts with your customers, and even contracts for specific jobs of your customers. Maybe on a very big job, a certain product, they get a different price. So uh, there's one more. Let's not forget, those of you with multiple branches, you might be selling the same product at different prices depending on the branch location. If this sounds like you, what are you doing to handle all of this? Are you looking at a manual price list? Are you calling a salesman to ask him the price he negotiated? Are you looking things up on spreadsheets? Or maybe your accounting office has to price the tickets at the end of the day or the next day. All of this is completely um, yeah, I don't. It's a waste of time, and it opens yourself up to a huge margin for error. Let's see how other masonry companies have been avoiding these issues. First of all, let's go back to a product that we looked at before. We looked at this paver, and there's quite a bit of information here, but let's focus on something right here, pricing levels. There are 20 different pricing levels, A through T. And that corresponds to an assigned price level per customer. So that's the first thing you can do. A C customer, it'll pull the C price automatically. And that's basic and works very well. What if you have multiple branches? 
Or maybe you're a producer of brick and block, and at the location where it's produced, it's one price. But when you send it to a branch, there's transportation costs and man hours to load and unload, so that's a different price. That would be something called zone pricing for us. And that's handled, let me see if I could show it to you so you can read it, and it's not an eye test. OK, so you might sell a product from your main division at a certain price. Then depending on the division, you might mark it up or down, so the plus or the minus, or it's equal to another branch. You can then print price lists for each division, either with the resulting price with the upcharge or the pr price plus showing the original price plus the additional. Regardless of you know how you print and what you do, that would be an important thing for anyone who has a branch where they're selling at different prices on the different branches. Now, what about customer pricing, contract pricing? When we talk about contract pricing, there's two types. There's the regular, you know, I negotiated with this company. Maybe it's the city of wherever you are, or um, a particular um, contractor. And you've said, OK, for these 100 items, you're going to get a special price that doesn't correspond to anyone else's price. Or maybe it's based on category and not just item. That's all doable. But it goes further than that, right? Because what happens if you're dealing with a large construction company, they have multiple jobs going. And let's say they have this huge job they're going to build. And so they negotiate special prices for just the products on that job. Well, then that ship to that job is going to get their prices, whether you enter uh, the you know, product and point of sale in the order. As long as you reference that job, the system will remember those prices. And then you, can, of, course, of course, can print contract pricing lists so that you can see and review, and your, your salespeople can have those prices with them as they go on the road. The point is, there's no more scrambling for price lists or notes or looking for the salesperson. People can actually be out sick, and you would still know what the prices are supposed to be. Now, speaking of customer jobs, has this ever happened to you? Hey, Arlene. It's uh, Mike again. Can you give me a list of everything I've purchased for job 1234? OK, we've met many Mason suppliers who've asked, who are asked by their customers to do tedious manual reports for them. In essence, tracking what's been sold by job so that the customer can build back his customer. In one sense, you might say, that's their problem, right? But actually, you're providing a value-added service by giving them that. So how are you accomplishing that? We've seen spreadsheets. We've seen manual things that people are doing. Let's see if this is easier. The customer job tracking report. I'm going to run it from, no, that's not what I'm going to run it from. I'm going to run it from 1-1-2011 for this customer. As soon as I put in the customer, I can pick his job. We're going to pick, let's pick all jobs. And the job tracking report is now being printed for all jobs for this customer from 1-1-2011. The first section has no jobs. So these are products they bought for themselves. But as you go down the list, now we start with their jobs. So some jobs had a couple of items. Some jobs had extensive items. So the fact that you can give this to your customer quickly, you could email it to them almost immediately, is something that no big box store can do, not Lowe's, not Home Depot. They're going to come to you if they want service like this. OK, we understand that not everything happens at the counter. If you take phone orders or do you have salesmen on the road, then you no doubt issue quotes. So when you enter lengthy quotes in your system, as I've already done, so I'm going to bring one up for you, what happens if you enter a quote an extensive one, like I'm going to show you. I just entered this quickly before this session. And actually, I cloned a prior quote, which is something that you can do in the system. So you can pull prior orders and replicate them and then edit them. But in this case, this is a huge job going on in town. And three of my customers are, are uh, trying to bid on this job. I can enter the quote once, go to the header, 
click this little button and it will allow me to change the customer and issue a quote to my other customers. When the job is actually awarded, I can you know, put that customer in there, convert it to a sales order, and automatically the product is then allocated. We're not going to worry about his credit limit right now. So I have a sales order in here. He's going on hold because he is over his credit limit. So he, he will have to be, will, that order will have to be released in order for something to happen. Now one thing that we didn't uh, touch on is the fact that when you're printing these orders, invoices, picking documents, it's important for some of you to have the weight on the item. So depending on the format of the uh, form that you're printing, that you choose, you'll be able to print line item weights or total weights or no weights at all. That just depends on what you want to do. When you convert the quote to an order, there's no redundant entry and you're able to then also convert those prices to contract pricing because maybe you negotiated special pricing on that quote. Now you want to convert it to uh, contract pricing. There's no need to re-enter anything. Okay. So now what happens if your contractor calls you yesterday, asks for product, says he's going to come in today or later that day, whatever. Do you need to, at the counter, let's put ourselves back at the front counter where we're always looking at this screen. Do we need to get out and go to sales order and invoice that in a different module, slow down the counter? No, we don't. We can enter that order right here. Customers on, on hold, but this is the order that we just did. I would be able to, and the, the fact that this is coming up on hold, by the way, should be important to you because if the customer comes in at the counter thinking he's going to bypass the fact that he's over his credit limit, he won't be able to do that. So with all of these controls, you can really protect your, um, your uh, collections and your profitability and still keep the counter moving. Okay, three quick questions, three quick answers. What about aggregate sales? Do you have a truck scale in your operation? If so, how is that incorporated into your front counter? Or is everything standalone? To maximize efficiency and be sure that you capture every sale without someone, for example, driving off without the transaction being recorded or billed, a scale interface will help you with that. So we're just going to show you very quickly. Um, you have two little buttons down here. This is the button that reads the scale order. This is the button that is a scale entry. I already have entries from an actual scale here. As I click on any one of them and I show you the screen, here's what actually happens. I would start with a blank screen. I'd look out the window, probably know that the truck is sitting on the scale. I'd do a click and the scale would start reading the weight. It would give me an in weight. I can tell the system whether it's a truck, a trailer, or a pickup outside. I can also tell it how many people are in the truck, which is one thing we just learned recently at, at a masonry yard, that sometimes you know, they pull in with two people, and then somebody jumps out, or three people, and two people jump out, and there's more product that can go in for free. So uh, we're trying to outsmart, outsmart everyone. <laughs> Um, you're able to put in a color or type in the type of uh, you know, um, truck that's sitting on the scale. And you would close this screen with no out weight. Then when the system, when the uh, truck is loaded and it comes back on the scale, it knows the tear weight. Now it's going to calculate the net weight. And at that point, you're able to, let's show you this, take the completed Put in your product, and the system knows how many tons in this case because it's all by tonnage on the truck. OK, one other little thing about this. If you're loading your own truck to go out, if you cre create a truck file, you can tell the system the tear weight of the truck right, the empty weight, and then the maximum weight. So why is that important? Because when you put product on a delivery ticket, the system will flag you when you're over the maximum weight, which is really important so that you don't, uh, you know, you don't receive citations from the police and so forth, and you don't really endanger anyone. Okay, third 
A second question and answer. Do you ever send out a delivery and expect your driver to collect from the customer? So if you do that, how do you track it? Manually, a clipboard, or we hope not, but your memory. If your memory is anything like my memory, this is a scary thing. So here's how other masonry companies are handling this. When the driver goes out, let's just say he's going with 10 pallets of this. We know he's over his credit limit. This amount of money is due from driver. Rather than faking the system or saying that I'm billing it, because I'm not billing it, because this customer is over his credit limit, I can put this amount in the due from driver. And that will print on the bottom of the invoice. That is, I'm not going to print right now because I want to kind of keep this moving. Well, maybe I am. <laughs> OK, let's show you where that money went. It went to the due from driver report. There's that $4,000. That ticket, when the driver comes back, can be completed. total it, take the money out of due from driver, and we'll just put it in cash. So what's the benefit of this? Well, if this goes overnight, if the driver was, you know, 200 miles away and he can't get back, you will not lose track of what money was due. That's very helpful. Final question, do you have a ready mix operation? If you do, are you using ready mix batching systems such as Sysdyne or SysTech? Uh, there's Command Alcon out there. If you can integrate ready mix into your system so that the ready mix tickets are uploaded and then you can generate your invoices either in a batch, usually in a batch, um, then that's going to save a lot of trouble, right? Because it's all going to be from one system and you're going to be able to have one account receivable. Okay, final point. Some of you are producers on this call. What do you do? Do you track things in Excel spreadsheets? Do you have a little uh, you know, access program? Well, if you can integrate block and brick management into your system, then you can track the raw materials. You can upload the finished products with just a click. So we're just going to quickly show you the concept. And the concept is this. You have different mix designs. For example, at M21 here, I have all my raw materials. And if you look here, I have lots of mix designs. Those mix designs, I don't really have lots of them. I have maybe six of them. But look how they're used. They're used in block setups. So if you look down this list here, the same mix type can be used in many different products. It might be um, a varying ingredient, if you will, um, on some of them, but that can be added on the production order. So when you have these block setups, there's no need for redundant entry. What happens is when you look at your um, production orders, let's see if we can just look at one that's already started here. Here we go. So if you look at this, you can create a production order for stock, if you spell it correctly, or for a particular customer's sales order, if it's a special order. Once you create that, you can track the batches that go into the hopper every day or during a particular day, and you can add batch information. So once you do this, you can say, OK, you know, I had this batch and uh, this quantity. Just add the appropriate information the run hours, the down hour, uh, hours, and then your product. What products did you use? It's telling you the potential products, but you have to tell it what you actually used. It's going to deplete those raw materials, and when the job is completed, upload the finished goods into your inventory. You can also track labor hours, general and administrative overhead. You can even have the system attrib attribute an overhead factor to your labor hours. All of this winds up in reports. And these reports can be just 
critical in helping you to see that you're making enough profit on your jobs and so forth. Um, so we'll leave you with this report just to give you an idea. So for producers, obviously, we gave you the least amount of time, but um, you know, it gives you a good idea of what you can possibly do. So this is what some of uh, other companies in the masonry industry are doing to get that edge to keep things moving at the counter and to keep their inventory accurately and have all their accounting handled. Uh, at this point, I think we're going to turn this over. We kind of overstayed our wel welcome a little bit. I'm sorry for that. And I'll turn it back to you, Mark. OK, thank you, Arlene. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to use the questions pane again on the right-hand side uh, of your screen. You can put your hand up. You can um, type in a question. We'll unmute you if you want, and uh, we'll listen to you. Um, also, we're going to uh, we've been recording this particular webinar, and what we'll do is send that out to everybody. If you want to share it with other folks in the company, other members of your uh, evaluation team or decision team, um, they can look at that at their leisure. It's pretty convenient. Okay, I see someone with a question. I'm just going to unmute them. Hi there, Rocco. Okay, looks like uh, Rocco has a question. Rocco? Can you hear? Maybe we're having a little audio problem. Yeah, maybe. Uh, it looks like you're using your computer microphone. Um, I don't know if you have it locally muted as well. Maybe that uh, would open it up for you. If not, it's OK. If you want to type your question in the questions pane, we would see that. OK. And, well, uh, we can you, always contact Yeah, you us. can always yeah, email it to us as well later on. Sure. In fact, we've got the, um, uh, the contact information slide open right now. Uh, feel free to give us a call there, or you can uh, email us directly, and we'll be happy to help you out. Uh, any questions at all? Okay. Looks like um, uh, we're all set here. If anybody has any questions later or if you want more information, again, please feel free to give us a call. Our corporate number is 1-800-536-1633 and dial extension 1 for sales. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. I do well, see a question like, in the question. Yeah. <laughs> looks like Rocco's question came up. Okay. I can't see it. but. Can you, Mark? Uh, where can we find out more information about your production accounting software? Best way to do that would be through a personal demo where we'll take you through every aspect of the software. Um, I see that um, right now you might be using Mass90. Um, I am somewhat familiar with that, so we can you know, talk about the, the comparisons. Our brick and block production was written specifically for that. It's not a general bill of materials. It was specifically written for brick and block based on a couple of the companies you saw at the beginning of this uh, session. So we definitely could have a one-on-one you know, -on -one session on that, and we'll definitely contact you to do that. Yeah. OK, great. Any other questions? OK, great. Well, we appreciate everyone's time for joining us today. We hope you found it useful, and uh, we look forward to being in touch with you shortly. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.